Okay. Hi, I'm Kauthar, and this is Arpan. We're both PhD uh, students in computer science. We're going into our second year, and we're at Ohio State in the Network-Based Computing Laboratory. Today, our talk will be on distributed deep neural network <laughs> training using MPI in Python. So a brief overview of what we'll be covering. We'll first discuss what deep learning is. We'll discuss a brief history of deep learning and how it influenced current trends. And then we'll go into why we need deep learning frameworks, why we need to parallelize applications. And then we'll slightly go over the message passing interface. And Arpan will talk about distributed training. And then we'll conclude. OK, so what is deep learning? Deep learning is a subset of machine learning that's a subset of artificial intelligence. And it's possibly considered the most revolutionary subset. So a big difference between machine learning and deep learning, as depicted in this image, is the feature extraction phase. So if we look at it sequentially, you have some sort of input. There's something that happens in the back end. And then you have a prediction as the output. The feature extraction phase can be a very tedious process that has to be done manually by an expert in machine learning, whereas in deep learning, that can be covered by what we're calling models. So from a developer's perspective, first you can identify deep learning as a solution to a problem. Then you determine some sort of data set you want to work with. Then you select a deep learning algorithm you want to use, and then you use that large data set to train an algorithm. So some examples of deep learning applications. Deep learning applications can fall into different categories. We'll go over three of them. Computer vision is how a computer can get a high level understanding from images or videos. So stuff like image recognition, object detection, face recognition. And in this image over here, it's not only about what the image is, it's also classifying it. So the red is objects and the yellow are people. Another example of deep learning applications is speech analysis. So you can find speech analysis in Hey Siri, OK Google, Alexa. And um, it's, it uses audio and, vi uh, and visual and video to determine, um, I'm sorry, it uses audio and it analyzes the patterns to detect what's going on. So it uses human language. Natural language processing is the interaction of computers and languages. So it's language translation, language understanding, summarizing text, and understanding the language. So in this next example, you have Google Translate. Based on the user's preference, you can take an image of something in a different language and convert it to, in this case, English. These examples over here, if you have just a doodle, you can convert it to a professional painting. If you have something in a different language, it can detect the text on there and then convert just the text to a different language so you still maintain the object. And then over here, this is caption generation. So based on the picture, based on what's going on in there, it develops a caption. Now we'll discuss a brief history of deep learning and how certain trends influence how we know deep learning today. So the first question that was brought about by artificial intelligence is if you can simulate human behavior. And that wasn't accomplished immediately, but the concept of deep learning has existed for a really long time. We just didn't have the computing resources or the affordability to be able to implement something on such a large scale. And now we see a resurgence of deep learning because we have so much more computing power. We have more machines that we can exploit the parallelization in. And we can parallelize our application, which is the idea of multiple processes or multiple executions running at the same time without dependence on previous processes. And this is also where the message passing interface will come into the picture, which we'll go over in more detail later. And we also have large data sets now, like ImageNet, which contains millions of images. And we have much larger scientific applications that require deep learning. And we're able to more accurately, tra accurately train models um, with better training algorithms. Now, Arpan will go over some deep learning frameworks. So, are you excited about deep learning? <laughs> yeah? Do you have any DL application idea? Like, do you, uh, do you want to implement deep learning model in some application? Well, I'm pretty sure you should have. And uh, so, what should you do if you have a deep learning application idea and you want to implement it? And uh, you want to implement the DL model into your application? 
well then you have to learn all of these things well, that's very difficult like you have to learn image analysis derivatives probability training algorithms and continuous optimization so well i am not a mathematics person so i don't want to learn it and uh, also like uh, if you want to imp implement the deep learning model then you have to uh, know about the gpu programming and uh, uh, and distributed computation so it's a lot of thing you want to focus on your dl application not on implementing it okay so that's why we have deep deep learning frameworks they hide most of the complicated mathematics from you and uh, so that you can focus on the architecture of the DNN and you can focus on your application without worrying about uh, its implementation and the performance of uh, uh, the DL training. Over the decade, there are so many uh, DL frameworks which are emerged. For example, Google TensorFlow, Facebook PyTorch, Berkeley Cafe, and the Microsoft CNTK. So this picture is uh, depicting like there are so many uh, DL frameworks. Do you know what is the common thing among these DL frameworks? Any idea? Yes? Yes, that's a common thing. Yes, because they are DL frameworks. They should have the uh, neural network in it. Well, the common thing is they all provide interface in Python. So that's why you can easily use deep learning frameworks uh, in your own application without having worrying about learning a new language. Uh, and also, if you want to build a uh, deep learning application, you have to use data analysis and the data and do data visualization, So, which is pretty easy in the Python. You can use libraries like Pandas or CNT or Scikit-learn or like sklearn so, uh, to easily uh, analyze the data and visualize it. And since the Python is a scripting language, so uh, you can easily uh, code in it. Many of the DL developers are not from the computer science area. So that's why uh, they don't want to learn a new language, like uh, that they don't want to learn a very difficult language. So that's why Python is here to help you. So for instance, if you want to implement a deep learning model using the Python, you just have to import uh, DL <laughs> framework, and then you are uh, you have to just call uh, deep learning train. After two hours, you are done. You have a uh, trained deep learning model which you can use. But on the other hand, if you want to do it in the C++, then you first of all you have to write 5,000 lines of code, which will take a huge amount of time and waste most of your energy. Okay. <laughs> So, and after that, even after uh, wasting so much time, you won't be able to run it because you have to solve so many errors. Like you have to debug each and every line of your code. I'm a terrible programmer. Okay, <laughs> I can't write uh, a code without a bug. I will have error at uh, every single line if I'm writing it in C. Okay, so uh, that's why Python is awesome. You can use Python to implement your deep learning framework to implement your deep learning model. So next is the parallelizing applications. OK, so why do we need to parallelize our applications, specifically in deep learning? Since it takes a lot of time and it requires a lot of resources, being able to parallelize the applications means the work, a lot of work can be done in much less time. So for example, larger and deeper models are being proposed over time, from AlexNet, ResNet, NASNet, to AmubuNet. So we go from about seven layers of a deep learning model to thousands of layers. And these require a lot of memory and a lot of computation that may not be sustained by just one machine. So having multiple machines, or in this case we're talking about graphics processing units, you're able to execute processes on several machines at the same time without dependence on a previous process. And you're also able to execute processes within a machine. And single GPU training isn't the only uh, solution. You also can have multiple GPUs. And then once you have multiple GPUs, you want to look into how you can exploit a specific a one GPU to be able to parallelize your application. And this is where the message passing interface falls into place. So if you want to distribute a program across multiple machines, you have to be able to communicate between different processes. And you need some sort of communication interface for that. And that's where MPI comes to solve the problem. 
The message passing interface is used in parallel applications so that processes can communicate information with each other. So you can ex execute applications at a much larger scale and you can optimize the data movement. Two specific communication patterns that we'll go over in more detail today. So point to point communication is when you have two processes communicating with each other. So for example, if I was communicating information to Arpan, he would receive the information. Whereas I'm communicating information to all of you, that's considered collective communication. Now in our lab, um, we developed some, an MPI library called Enva Pitch 2. And the attraction of this library is that it's optimized for both the central processing unit communication and GPU communication. And it's been empowering top 500 supercomputing systems for over a decade. Now a little more detail on point-to-point -point communication. First, you have a sender process that has a specific data and it specifies where it wants to send that data. Then you have a receiver process that's waiting for that data from the sender. So in this example, process zero has data value three and process one is waiting on process zero to get that data value. And here's an example of a send and receive communication in Python. Something important to note here is you do need this MPI for PUI library to support uh, MPI communication in Python. So what this example is showing is process, this code is being executed by both processes. So you want to be able to distinguish what process zero will be doing and what process one will be doing. So process zero is the sender that has the data and you're telling it to send it to process one. And process one is the receiver that's waiting on process zero to get that data. In collective communication, you can have multiple processes communicating with multiple processes, or you can have one root process communicating with multiple processes. And the output can be a reduced result that would be in reduced communication, or it can be the same result on multiple processes. So these are some examples of reduced operations, like if you have multiple processes with various data, you can reduce it by getting just the maximum or the minimum, the summation, the product, and there are more reduced operations. So in MPI reduce, you have processes zero to three each have a data value, and then you reduce these with some sort of reduce operation. In this example, we're using sum. You get data value 18, and the source process would be process zero holds that value. You have broadcast, where one process is sending the same data value to all the other processes, and you have all reduce, where you have multiple processes have different data values, and you use a reduce operation and send that reduced uh, value to all the processes. So now each of these processes hold the value 18. And these are all very important in deep learning, especially MPI all reduce. That's used a lot in the training process. And here's an example of broadcast, MPI broadcast in Python. So again, this is executed by all the processes. But remember, in bro broadcast, there's one process sending value to all the other processes. So you want to specify that the root, or in this case process zero, has the data, while all the other processes have no data. And then this is executed by all of them. You're saying broadcast the data from root zero to all the other processes. Now Arpan will go over the importance of distributed training. Okay, so now you have some idea about MPI. So now you can distribute your applications. So let's uh, talk about the DNN and how can we train deep neural networks. Then we will talk about the distributed training. So deep neural networks, from a user perspective, it is uh, the input is the image of a car, and the deep learning model is something like a black box. Well, and the details are hidden from the user. So it is just a black, it is just a process which is going to map input to the output. Uh, and in this case, the output is the car, which is a prediction. From a developer perspective, the input is the data set, which is like a collection of the images uh, of car or some, uh, some other vehicles which, are, which you are going to classify. And here the deep learning model is a multi-layer uh, is a multi-layer model which is go which going to map the data set to the prediction. So this is how a deep neural network works. So let's have a deep learning training example. In this, let's assume that you have an assembly line which is uh, going to assemble a car for you, okay? So here the input is the raw, ma raw material and uh, 
uh, and the, there are different uh, layers uh, which is depict, uh, depicting the deep neural network. So layer number one is going to add doors to the car and then layer number two is going to add windows to the car and the layer number three is going to add wheels to the car. So in this way you are going to have a assembled car in the end. So in the similar way the when the input is the image of a car uh, multiple layers will try to convert the input to the output uh, using some mathematical functions. So in the end you will have the predictions. So this is known as the feed forward phase, feed forward uh, method and then you are going to at first the output will be wrong because uh, you, you haven't trained your model. So you have to calculate the error. So error is uh, calculated by comparing the predictions and the actual output. So after calculating the error, you are going to back propagate the error to each and every layer so that uh, they can correct them themselves according to the data set. So uh, in this case, like the error is used to calculate the gradients, which is like a, a correct amount of corrections which are needed in the mathematical function of each and every layer. So the, in summary, if you want to say what is the deep uh, neural network, it is like a mathematical function which is going to map the input to the output. Each and every thing in our real world can be mapped using the, there is a relation between the input and output and it can be simulated by the mathematical function. Okay, so here is an example of a three layer neural network first you are given uh, you are going to give the input at the input layer and then you will get the output at the output layer and then these two middle layer uh, these two middle layers are known as the hidden layers where the most of the computation will happen these are the layers which are going to convert the input into the output so uh, let's implement a deep uh, uh, dnn in python using tensorflow and keras First of all, you have to uh, load Keras library and then define the type of the model. After that, uh, you have to add layers to your model. In this example, we are adding two layers, which are dense layers. Uh, and uh, after that, you have to compile your model and you have to give the loss function and the optimizer. The loss function is used to calculate the error and the optimizer is, is a training algorithm which will be used in your training uh, uh, DL model. So in the last stage, you are going to train the model using the model.fit method, uh, which requires input data, which is the x underscore train, and the output data, which is y underscore train. Okay. So you can implement a DL model in six lines, which is way better than the 5,000 lines. <laughs> okay. So let's move to the TensorFlow Playground. So we are going to give a quick demo on the TensorFlow, how you can use the TensorFlow to build your DL model. Okay, so here we are going to classify a, a two-dimensional point into two categories, orange and the blue. So these are the orange points and uh, these are the blue points. The, in the input, there are two neurons since we are having two inputs, x and y coordinate. In the output, we have two neurons because we are going to predict whether it belongs to the orange category or the blue category. Okay? So, and in the head, we are using only one hidden layer here, which consists of four neurons. So, let's train this model. As you can see, after some time, uh, the DL model is trained and it is able to classify uh, the points into the orange and blue category. So uh, DL, uh, DL model is able to model the mathematical function which requires, uh, which is required in this uh, uh, data set. So let's take an another data set. Uh, suppose that uh, you have this data set. So can the sim same model uh, uh, mimic the mathematical function which is required here. So let's train it. Let's find out. So the DL model can do it. So the same DL model can do two different things. It depends on the training. Uh, the, like uh, it depends on your training data set. So
So, if you uh, if you have a very complex mathematical function, then you have to add more layers. So, like in the real life, the relation between the input, like the image and the output, for example, you are predicting a car, is a very complex. So, uh, here there is a very complex mathematical function. So, th therefore, you need uh, more number of layers. So, you can add more number of layers. As you add the more number of layers, the the amount required, the the time required to uh, train the model will also increase. That's why you need distributed tra training. Okay. Oops. Okay. So, a quick recap: the key phases of deep learning are first you train your model, and then you will deploy your model to uh, make inference. And in the second. The DNN training is a compute intensive process. As you increase the number of layers, you are going to, uh, the time required to train the model will also increase. So, how can we achieve a faster training? Well, you can upgrade your hardware. For example, if you are using, how many of you are aware of GPUs here? Okay, most of you are. Okay, so if you are using a K80 GPU, then uh, it will uh, uh, require around five days to train LXNet? Am I wrong? Or I don't know, like, I never trained it, <laughs> no, LXNet. I never trained LXNet, okay. So, if you are using a Volta V100, then it will take around one hour? Maybe, yeah. So, uh, you can upgrade your GPUs, but there is a limit. You can't, uh, like, if you are uh, training it on the huge data set and uh, your uh, model is very big, then you need some, uh, you need multiple GPUs. So, how you are going to do it? So, let's take an example. So, we are using the same example here. Like, uh, if you are having the three assembly lines, then you will be producing three cars at one time. So, your output is thrice. So, in the same way, we can do the similar thing in the deep learning. So, there are so many polarization strategies in deep learning, but uh, the by far data parallelism is very common and very easy to use. So, basically in the data parallelism, you are going to replicate the model across among, uh, among n number of machines. Here you can uh, assume the machine as a GPU or a CPU and then you are going to train the model simultaneously on each machine. So, uh, you, are doing to, uh, you are going to do a forward propagation and then followed by a backward propagation in the backward propagation, you are going to calculate the gradients. So, the, these uh, gradients are, should be communicated among the processes so that uh, the training can be synchronized among the machines. We, are, we want to train a 1DL model, not 4DL model here. Okay? So, that's why we have to uh, synchronize, synchronize the training. So, let's talk, about the, uh, let's talk about how to implement distributed training using MPI. Okay, so over here, this shows replicating models across multiple machines in parallel. So you can imagine each of these processes happ happening simultaneously on different GPUs. And doing this in parallel, you end up calculating an output based on the input. And then you calculate an error that Arpan described earlier. And based on the error, you can calculate a correction. Now, the reason you need MPI reduced over here is you want to reduce it to the same correction that you'd end up broadcasting to multiple processes so that you can have uh, your models being trained in a similar fashion. Now, over here, we're just trying to depict the importance of having many machines over having less machines. So, if you have uh, different models that are being trained on GPUs, this is an example of training a model on one GPU versus 512 GPUs, and the number of images per second drastically increases as you increase the number of GPUs. So this is probably around 500 images per second on one GPU, whereas when you have 512 GPUs, it goes over 60,000. Now, to conclude our talk, why do we use Python? We use Python for the simplicity, the readability, and since it's a scripting language, you can al also automate many processes. It has many of the libraries and the frameworks that are needed in deep learning, so you don't have to uh, manually do all the work. 
And why we use MPI is to communicate amongst multiple processes. We don't only want to communicate amongst different machines, we also want to communicate within the machines and communicate the same information across. We also use MPI to implement high performance computing and to use large scientific applications. And why we use distributed is to spread this process and optimize to training performance. And then with these three, we can enhance and optimize the performance for distributed training. Now, these are some things going on in our lab right now. There was a new tutorial for high performance deep learning accepted at Micro 19, which is a conference in Columbus. Uh, this is presented by some people in our lab. And our advisor is teaching a high performance deep learning course. If you're a student at Ohio State, it's a graduate level course that's offered next fall. So in this course, you are going to learn about, uh, uh, in the course, you are going to learn about different DL models and uh, how to, uh, and the different communication libraries and the different distribution strategies. So, okay, then thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have some time for the questions if you. Yes, can we have questions? Yes. Okay, yeah. Are either of you guys on Twitter? No. <laughs> Our group is on Twitter. Yeah. Look up Amba Pitch. Okay. Okay. Why is the if you go back to taking the graphs of the images for GPU? Okay. This one? Yeah. Why is it exponential not linear? Do you have five hundred? You are doubling. Uh, this uh, the GPUs are in square power. Uh, yeah. So it's doubling every step. Like so it is doubling every step. Yeah. So the ideal scale would be around, uh, if you have an ideal scaling, then it will be around 70,000 images, but uh, uh, due to the communication overhead, we are, we are only hitting around 65,000 uh, 65, images. Okay. So any other questions? Yes? So the model weights are like the parameters of the mathematical function. So you can assume uh, like the weights are like a uh, parameters of the mathematical function, and that mathematical function is going to map the input to the output. Okay, it is the gradients. Okay. It is the gradients. Okay. Yes. Using MPI? Okay. Using MPI, she can um, comment. MPI, if you're a Python programmer, MPI for PY is a good website to get started. And there have tutorials and examples on there. Okay. And uh, regarding the deep learning, I would recommend, oh, I forgot his name. Like, Introduction to Machine Learning. Andrew NG. Andrew NG, yes. <laughs> I learned it from him. So, I can't, <laughs> I can't say anything. Okay. And if you want to contact us, we have my OSU ID is Jan.575. So. Um, also, if, if any of your students at Ohio State, there's an intro to parallel computing class that covers MPI and covers GPU programming. It covers a lot of things in the class. OK. Yes? Okay, so basically, Horoboard is using MPI uh, in its backend. So Horoboard is like a high-level uh, library which can which you can use to uh, distribute your program. So in the backend, it will be using MPI. So it is abstracting uh, all the information from you, like all the details. Uh, any other questions? Okay, thank you.